there was a lot of northern people that lived there that were working in the shipyards and you know in all the big industry in New Orleans, mm -hmm. because, you know Mississippi River, the mouth of Mississippi. So where we lived, we lived in a residential neighborhood, but where we lived was predominantly, as you know, being dark skinned. It was a white neighborhood that, not by our choice, my father bought a small house. Mm -hmm. But just a mile from us was the uh, black neighborhoods were tar paper shacks. You ever hear of tar paper shacks? No, I haven't looked tar at it. Tar paper shacks were houses that was, some of them could have been as small as this, mm -hmm. or doubling us up or tripling up, and they had screen windows and tar paper roofs. Oh, you know, tar they, paper shacks. Some shingles and stuff, that's what they call them, tar paper shacks. Oh, wow. And then, you know, the, old, the wood. And they were like almost like make, makeshift, you know, in other words, poverty, impoverished. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, a lot of them had chickens and goats and, you know. And, and that's and, Louisiana. And Louisiana, right down the road from, from where I lived, you know. Wow. And I, I would see people, you know, some of the kids in the neighborhood, if they'd see someone you, you know, you're the dog's going to be ride by a bike. Mm -hmm. Bang, have you, you know, you know, and these are kids that were raised up. And then I had other friends that would just say, what are you doing, what are you wow. doing? And I was one of them, I was like, what are you doing, you know? But we, we grew up in that type of environment because that part of Louisiana wasn't like, if you went northern Louisiana, that's where more you would have those little towns of very uh, uh, segregated towns of, you know, Ku Klux Klan type people and all oh, wow. that. Wasting, which they're still there now in some of those small rural areas, you know. And where we lived, there was more people that were working in industry and the ports and, you know, uh, career people that, you know, like, just like New York City. If you were right by the bay over there, any any major port, you know, San Francisco, you'd have a big mix of people. And what year was that when you was down there going through I was there for 19, when I was six years old, 1960. 1959, because I was six years old, I was born in 53, to 1969, and uh, we came up here just after uh, the end of, I think it was right near the end of our school year, that year, mm. you know, 1969, it was because I remember I finished, I was in the seventh grade and just finished school, mm. and it came up here, you know, we, we claimed, my father claimed bankruptcy. And how was it going to school down there, how was it? The schools were very, very strict. A lot of people said they were behind us. They're just the opposite. When I came here and I went to Jim Junior High, people were boys. I was 16 years old. It was like I felt like I was in a real bad area. They were carrying bottles of whiskey in their pocket. And wow. Some guys had knife, pocket knives and stuff. And you know, it, drugs were everywhere because it was 1970 or 71 when I started going to school here. I went to Jenks and Tolman, the old Jenks is off Broadway in Pawtucket. Mm. That old bar now it's like a, a group home. It's like a, a home for people that are handicapped and elderly. You know, my sister lives here with her husband. Of course, mm. we're in their 70s. You know, so. you but remember the, the name schools of down south were very strict. Sometimes I had a football coach as a, as a history teacher. Oh, wow. And, and they had what they call, um, now you can't touch a kid. Those schools, I'm talking about a public school. Everybody talks about Catholic schools and nuns who hit you with a ruler. Mm -hmm. I went to a public school in Louisiana and they have what they call paddlings. They, they have a board, maybe three feet long, two feet long, with a handle on it, with two holes in it. And if you're a boy and you act it up, it makes you make bend over the grab your ankles. Bam! Wow. Bam, hit you like twice. Yeah, the girls would have to write, I must not talk, you know, must not behave myself. They, they wouldn't do that to the girls, but to the boys. The boy, They disciplined you, in other words. Because wow. I remember I snuck into the auditorium with another boy. You know, we used to watch those old shows, Tarzan. Mm -hmm. And we got those big ropes, you know, when you open up the big curtains. And we were swinging, going back and forth, and the principal <laughs> come walking to the door. Wow. You remember, hey! You remember the name of your school? Huh? You remember the name of the school? It was called Slido Grammar. Slidell Grammar School, elementary school, Slidell Grammar. And then I went to Salmon, Salmon High School, which was a school they just built. It was a high school and junior high mix, because mm -hmm. Slidell wasn't a big city. Mm -hmm. It was a town when we first moved in, then it turned into 
a city when the population started growing. So they built the high school. That was my last year there. And even that school, the, the, you know, the board with the holes in it, because mm -hmm. I remember we had what we call physical education every day in our last class. And we had football coaches as uh, our education, uh, you know, sports and education, physical education, made us do push ups, sit ups, mm -hmm. jog through our neighborhood while they were riding a bike, and they wore those shorts and they had the whistle hanging like side <laughs> of the car. And, and it, 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 we'd have to, you know, take a shot at the end of the, uh, we had like an hour of gym, uh, PE. Mm -hmm. We call it phys physical education, not gym. Mm -hmm. And of course, with boys, we go to the men's room, the boys' room. And some of the boys, especially being a teenager, would light up cigarettes. Wow. We weren't supposed to do that. And one of those coaches opened up the door. I was in there going to the back. I wasn't smoking. All the boys go, I guess, I smoked. These little cigarettes in the urinals. And all of a sudden, there's 10 of us in there. You know, there was a whole row of urinals. And, wow. And they, the coach said, all of you now. He wanted to know who was smoking. Nobody would talk. So he made all of us bend over. Well, the bell rang and the kids were going home to school, girls and the girls were giggling and crap. Wow. And whack each one of us twice. Man, it would it would sting. You'd be stinging for a little while. Yeah, I believe it. Twice, man. And hard, like, bam, bam. And you had to hold your just like this, like I'm doing now. They didn't make you pull your pants on, but just like this. Wow. Yeah, and that was in the south. And was was the school segregated or the neighborhood was segregated? They had just, thank you for asking that, because just my last year at Salmon High School was when Martin Luther King got assassinated. They had just segregated the school I was in, and they allowed about 12 uh, black students, if you want to say African-American, colored, uh, uh, dark-skinned people, uh, in the school, and it was, I think it was probably about maybe a hundred kids in that school, 150 kids, boys Just and girls. 12, wow. So was, there was trouble. And I remember when on recess I was walking by the basketball, you know we had basketball hoops in the, in the, in the schoolyard. The schoolyards in the south were big, because most of them mm -hmm. was where they played football and baseball, but they always had a basketball hoops. And some of the dark skinny boys were playing basketball. You know, they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I was walking on by and I said, I do. And they said, you want to play? And I started walking and then three of the white boys said, if you play with those, you know, they use the N-word, mm -hmm. you know, you'll be sorry. And then I got a little nervous, I got a little scared because you're in the deep south here, you know. And I, I'm saying to myself, and then, then they looked at me and said, we understand, you know. And then I, I just didn't do it, you know, because. Oh, that's all rough. Was, yeah. And then when Martin Luther King got shot, um, I was in, actually in school that day. And when he got assassinated, this redneck teacher we had, he says this openly, and there was two, two of the men in my class out of about 20 of us. And of course, they were your complexion. And he said, oh, he's going to get a $50 fine for shooting coon out of season. Wow. I remember those exact words. And I sat there and I looked at that teacher and I wanted to cry, but I also wanted to kill him, you know, mm -hmm. because I wasn't taught that. You know, my father hired a, a, a black man named Joe Guidry that used to go fishing with me and my brother. We used to take chances. We'd go on a saltwater lake, run a pool and go fishing. And um, I remember one time Joe Guidry would, he'd come to our house at five in the morning to get us before the sun would rise to go, to go fishing. And one time me and my brother overslept, my older brother, I was like 12, I, oh, that was, hey, I was about 14 because I was just getting, I was just in that school, I was in the seventh grade, 14 or 15 years old. And he's knocking on our bedroom window. And when we got out of the house, he said, you crazy, he, you know, he called my brother crazy B word. He said, mm -hmm. I'm in a white neighborhood and a black man knocking at your bedroom <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And, but we, he was just a, such a nice guy, but my father hired him to work at the gas station and he actually let him run the gas station when we, when my father went on vacation with my mother and us. I told him he let him run the, the, the gas station. Mm. And he ended up buying a mobile home and everything. And he lived in one of those neighbors I told you about where all the poor, poor black people live. Mm -hmm. And when my, one night my father drove us out there, we had one of those station wagons when we went to go see him. We, we go in his, in his trailer living room, and he had like a wife and three daughters, you know. Mm -hmm. And we see all these faces in the windows looking at us, and 
Joe Gibby says to us, don't worry, those are, those are my folks. they never seen white folks out here. I believe it. And guess what we got a letter from? The Ku Klux Klan. Oh, wow. My mom and dad got a letter from the KKK. They said we hate Jews. That's why we are this. The Star of David and the American flag. We hate blacks. We hate Jews. And they named a list of other different races that they, mm -hmm. but the, number, the first two races they talk about were Jews and blacks. Wow, that's rough. I can't imagine living like that. Yeah, and, and but we never, they, they never like do bricks on windows and all that kind of stuff because we actually lived in where we lived because it was northerners and southerners mixed and we were near the port and we were right by the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. We were by the saltwater, brackish water marshlands. Mm. Like you ever see the swamp people? No. On TV, the alligator hunters, if you look at Oh, them, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Lafayette and those kind of places were like 20 miles from us. Mm. And the, the Cajun people, they were Canadian descent people that wow. they lived off the land down there. And wow. uh, I went to school with Cajun people too, you know. And it, it was just a, I was really depressed when we came up here because I didn't know anybody and I had a lot of friends, you know. You know, when you're 15 years old, 16 mm -hmm. years old, you, Got a lot of friends from school and stuff in our neighborhoods, and it kind of it threw me for a loop, you know. I was mm -hmm. really depressed. So you came over here when you was 15? Yeah, 15 oh. or 16, then I went to Jenks Junior High. Because the school, when I went to Salmon High School in Louisiana, it had just opened, they mixed the grades together. Instead of just having a high school, they put the junior high and the high school as one. Mm -hmm. It went from like the, the, the seventh grade to the 12th. Because it, because the city wasn't big, so yeah. you only had so many students, and uh, they were just developing a football team, you know, organizing a high school football team called the Sound Spartans, you know. And I go online sometimes. I still see my my uh, house on Oak Street in Louisiana. I think it's 58 Oak Street. I, I Google it and I say, Oh my God! Wow. Uh, the, the brick house that I lived in, uh, my mom and dad had. So how was it? Did you have to adjust going to school up here? Yeah, it was a completely, totally different scene, and it was just, you know, some of the kids I went to school with, I call them the Fighting Irish, because I lived in an all-Irish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. McCoy Stadium was predominantly Irish area. Mm -hmm. Like Federal Hills predominantly was predominantly Italian. Like North Providence, was a lot of Italian. Mm -hmm. Well, that area was mostly Irish, and I call them the Fighting Irish. Mm -hmm. And they would make them, because I would say, hey, y'all, hey, y'all, y'all, y'all want to go out and play some baseball? You know, I had that, because being in Louisiana nine years, I had the southern accent. And what did they so, say up here? Huh? What did they say up here? They you? were calling me names. One of my friends, I made good friends, but his name was Jeff Donahue. He would call me Swamp Turkey. He, he, <laughs> he would call me, because you know, I was born in Massachusetts, Boston Baked Bean. Because being in Louisiana, I was very tan, you know, mm -hmm. was Mediterranean people, my mom came from Morocco, North Africa, and she was that Spanish, from French Morocco. My father was Canadian French, mm. but he was in, born in the United States. He met my mother during World War II. So uh, because of my mother, I had this, they hear from her family, so my father was bald head on the top, mm -hmm. and my complexion, so but like if I went to the beach every day, I'd get all tanned up, you know. But I, I don't do that no more, so I'm more lighter than what. But I was very kind of really tanned. Mm -hmm. So my Irish friends, they were very light-skinned, they would say, Hey, you Boston Baked Bean, and they started calling me Swamp Turkey and all that. Wow. But, but they became good friends with me, and we played ball together. And then they wanted me to get on the football team, coaches wanted to talk to my parents, because I was a receiver, and I played baseball too, the coaches wanted to... But the Vietnam War was on at that time, mm. and drugs was up here. That's what got me, is... Louisiana, I didn't see no drugs, no marijuana, nothing when I was in school. Up here, everybody was already buying ounces of weed, and there was mm. THC, mescaline, and LZ, LZ was everywhere. And what year was that? 1970, 71. Oh. When I went to school here, was I, I started school in 70 at Jenks Junior High. Matter of fact, I was still in the 7th. I, I, cause when we left Louisiana, I didn't finish the 7th grade. We left, I think it was either during the beginning of the year, I just started going to school before winter set in, mm -hmm. and uh, I continued going to school up here. But it was just a totally different atmosphere, totally different type of people. And uh, I didn't get no fights up here. It's just that people would laugh when I talked, because you know, you know, if the Irish kid would crack on me and 
front of our classroom, the whole room especially, he goes, hey, Bobby, the swamp turkey, mm -hmm. and Boston baked beans. <laughs> swamp turkey, and I never I heard to, of that. And I used to call him white trash. <laughs> 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 I wasn't black at that company. And, and everybody would roar, so I'd get even with him, because everybody would laugh at me when he said something. Mm -hmm. And we became good friends because of that, you know. Yeah, I get with the program. And, you know, I gave him the, I gave him, you know, right back, you know. I gave it to him right back, and that's how it was, you know. And of course, I also went to school with a lot of people from the projects. Right over here, there was a, a project called Crook Manor, and that was Gallagher Court. You know, since you're right over here, that was called Crook Manor years ago. It was flooded with cocaine and stuff. Oh, wow. I went to school with a lot of boys from there and the Prospect Heights in Pawtucket. Yeah, I heard CF was bad back in the day, yeah, real bad. It was bad. bad. And I, you know, some of those boys were my classmates, and they were rough. They were rough, man. And, and they liked me, though. Know, we became good friends. And, the guys I, uh, from Carolinas that were, you know, I say you're complex, if you don't mind, uh, colored mm -hmm. men. Yeah, I don't mind. They, they call them the Geechees from Carolinas, some islands where they talk like this, Gee, yeah, no, do. They talk fast like that. They say, what'd you say? <laughs> Instead of saying, did you eat yet, they go, Gee, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you say, no, do. I mean, no, did you. They, they would, uh, what do you call it, abbrevi like, it was like abbreviating the... the uh, yeah, like running out, run out of sentence. Yeah, yeah, they, they, but they would talk very, very fast. And I made friends with some of them guys, a big guy named Glenn Shelton and um, a little guy named uh, Williams. And I didn't call him this, but they nicknamed him Cheetah William. His own friends did. Because mm -hmm. he was a small guy, he was always puffing on cigarettes. And, and uh, he had me go to the projects one time. And all the Irish boys in Pertuck said, you're, you're going to the Prospect Heights. Don't go over there, Bob. You, that's a rough place. I said, come on, man. I'm going to be like He's my friend. Mm -hmm. and, and he took me in there. Everybody accepted me like a brother over there. And over there, but they were very integrated. There was a lot of poor white people and poor black people together in, in those days in the early 70s and projects. Mm -hmm. Now over there, there's a lot of Hispanic people, you know, whether they're Nicaraguan, Colombian, just like this place here. And uh, there's some still the old time people that are still here from way back. But that's just some of the stuff I would, I don't know. I imagine you've seen the world change a lot. Yeah, I did see a lot of changes, a lot of changes. You remember how old you was when you heard of uh, Black Wall Street? When I heard of what? Black Wall Street. When the market crashed, you mean? Yeah. Oh, God, I, I, I think I was working in East Providence as a printer. And I, uh, I had a friend of mine that came from northern Iran named Maisi. He was a, a, a consultant that was checking the waste of the company, trying to cut back on waste. Mm -hmm. There was a little guy and he wanted me to go to the stock market in New York. And he said, bring a thousand dollars, Bob, and I'll show you how to rent. He took that, I'll show you how to invest in stocks. I didn't know nothing about it, so I didn't go. I said, mm -hmm. the market crashed. I don't know if they call it Black Thursday or Black Monday. I think it happened in the 1980s or 1990s more. I think it was in the 90s somewhere. And at that time, I was already in my, I think it was in my 30s, 30 something so. And you got a lot of experience in New York? I, I went there many a time with my friend Lonnie, who lives right over in Lincoln. Uh, he's a Hammond B3 organ player. He was always, he played gospel, but he also played rhythm and blues and jazz. When he wasn't in church, he, would, he got hired a lot by a lot of musicians in New York, to, and we'd bring his big, you know, a big uh, Hammond B3 organ, how heavy they are, with a big Leslie speakers. Mm. We had dollies and stuff like that. We'd ship the organ over there, and I used to help him set up. Set up the PA, you know, the, uh, the organ and the, uh, the mics and stuff like that. Because the guitar players and drummers would hire him, and he played on a lot of play like Cleopatra's and uh, a place called Judy's in Harlem. He played in the oldest black, own jazz club in Harlem. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, if I called him now, he would name it. And I went there with him a number of times. I didn't play, but I helped him set up. He got mm -hmm. hired by a guitar player and a drummer to play, you know, mm -hmm. three or four hour sets. There. They'd play at seven at night or 8.30 till midnight or whatever. And it was like a restaurant, soul food. It was a soul food restaurant and jazz club. Mm -hmm. And it was the oldest one in the, one of the oldest and only one owned by an all-black all uh, group of people. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, like most of the other places in Manhattan were run by the very wealthy uh, 
you know, once they white people or whatever, mm -hmm. they ran most of those places. So you say you played the saxophone. And it was funny because I was with um, some of the other black artists that we you know, Ben Bonham and them, and they would be going like this with their horns. And I would bump into them and stuff, and they said, Bob, when we go this way, you go this way. We, he said, you with the cats now. I said, but I'm still a white man, and I didn't play, play that funky music, white boy. Remember Ben Bonner? They were laughing so hard. One time they said, go to the bridge. I said, which one, Newport or the Mount Hope? You know the bridge in the song. Yeah. And I would jokingly say, which bridge you want me to go over? There's like a lot of me here, but I went right by the bay. Wow. And they, they, we had so much fun, though, you know. Some of those guys passed on. Arthur has that I played with. He was a pretty popular baritone saxophone player who lives in New Mexico now. He's still alive. He's in his 70s. He played with Benson years ago. Mm. And they scattered in a song. And George Benson actually made a song, A Hazardous Journey, about Arthur Hazard. Because Arthur Hazard flipped over in a car one time driving. I think he was going somewhere with his daughter and he got in an accident down there and mm. rolled over with his car. Oh, he wow. said he was just yelling Jesus and Nothing happened to him and his daughter, they were all right, but... Yeah, I believe it. So where were you born at? Well, I was born like in, in Chelsea. I think I was born in the Navy Hospital. I was born in Chelsea, Massachusetts. We always say Boston. Mm -hmm. On my birth certificate it says Boston, because that's a suburb, I think, of, of, of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I lived there until I was not even one, and my my pops was in the Navy 10 years, and then we moved to... Uh, North Tonawanda, right by, if you go to Niagara Falls, you see a, uh, a city called Tonawanda. Well, we call it North Tonawanda. I don't know, it's an Indian name. Mm -hmm. And you can see Niagara Falls is right there, right there. Mm. And then Buffalo's in the distance. And, uh, you know, it, I guess it's equivalent to us here to Boston, you know, like a 40 mile, maybe, maybe closer. And uh, it was rough over there too, the snow, blizzards and stuff like that. So did, you, did you go to school over there? Uh, kindergarten. Oh, when okay. I was five, you know, when I was five, when I, we went to Louisiana when I was six. Oh, okay. But my first, any kind of school was only kindergarten. And kindergarten in those days, they didn't do much other than make you have milk and cookies and learn how to tie your shoes and coloring books and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Now they're probably making kids read and, and, and every other thing, you know. And this, how do you feel about this internet age? Like everything's changed over. With, with what? As far as the internet. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I see it two ways. I see it, there's positives with it, but there's a lot of negativity with it. I think that you're isolating a lot of people, especially people my age, my generation, that don't even know how to do that stuff. Like I, I just had a lady help me out with Facebook because I wanted to put a eulogy from my late minister, David Hector. Mm -hmm. I was with her in her office day when CC uh, called me, and I, um, she got me to, to be able to put my message up, because everybody else, when he passed away in 2013, to, uh, 2013 mm -hmm. I just put the message in today, a eulogy, how much I appreciated. He was uh, my Bible teacher for 35 years, and I assisted in prayer, and you know, picking oh, up wow. people, making phone calls, and I, uh, seen people that were actually demon-possessed. Mm. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen miracles. He was my Bible teacher. And because of that, when I went to Bible college in these last two years, I graduated with A's and B's. I have a couple of C's here and there because I had to take Bible psychology, uh, Bible uh, when, you, when you run in the office to, to help people with, you know, addictions. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you got to know, you know, like to be in a caseworker. Or, or pastor in a church, mm. or evangelism, uh, minister, uh, or you know, uh, missionary work. I took courses from Genesis to Revelation, and because of him, I got a lot of A's and B's across, almost on and all the way across. Wow. It took me two and a half years, almost yeah, about two and a half years to complete. And I jokingly said to the president of the Bible College, I said, I want straight A's across the board. He said, Bob, nobody. Nobody gets straight A's when it comes to Bible college, not even myself, and I'm the president of it. And, and, but I said, oh, I said, oh, glory to God, I was joking, you know, I said, I don't want to pat on my shoulder. I said, I look at it that I'd want it to be in the will of God, you know. 
His will be done in my life, not my will. Mm -hmm. so, something that I always pray, let thine will be done, not my will. Because I do evangelize even when I'm at the park. Sometimes I preach one-on-one, -on -one, you know. I've run into rough characters that biker guy come up to me, you, I want you to preach to me right here. And I did, you know. He had his leather jacket and his oh, Harley Davidson. But I did. It's okay. I'll, I'll preach right here. I've had people come up to me that were dying that I didn't even know that told me. I got, I won't be around much longer. I said, what are you talking about? I got cancer. I got a couple months to live. And right down in there, I administered to the person and preach and salvation, you know. And uh, and I, I wouldn't leave him with a, a doom message like, well, you're checking out in two months. I'll see you later. I'd say, no, God can still heal you. You might live to be 90 years old. A 40-year-old man was telling me that, you know. Mm -hmm. I ran into other people the same way that was sick. I went to hospitals more than once often. Uh, Cecil would tell you my late minister would send me to a hospital. Somebody called us that had cancer or they were really ill and said, Bob, uh, Bob I want you to go there with maybe one of the ladies from church or maybe a couple of other and go pray for that person they requested it. So we were just barging on anybody to pray, but mm -hmm. if somebody requested prayer, we would go and pray for that person. And what's the name of the church you grew up in? We were, actually it was a, the first, the United Church of the Firstborn of Jesus Christ. And it was on Camp Street, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, my minister, my Bible teacher stemmed out, his mother and father founded that church and people in his family. But he taught, actually he made his home a, a, a Bible studies church where he had church pretty much seven days a week. Mm. He'd have Bible classes like on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and they'd have a Sunday service. And then we had open invitation. Somebody could come to his house at midnight, mm. 10. And, uh, oh, he's dedicated. And five them. Oh, yeah. He, one time he had a mafia man come over to his house at 2 in the morning ringing the doorbell. And, I wasn't there, I was at my apartment, and his wife got up and made coffee, and the guy was crying. He said, I'm in this organization, I never, I couldn't get out of it, and he, he, he repented and accepted Jesus Christ. That's but we always told people, God said he came for the unrighteous, not the righteous. Um, Absolutely. Uh, anybody can get saved no matter what they've done in life. And that man is still alive to this day. I'm not going to call his name, but he's elderly, he's older than me. Mm -hmm. He's in his... He's got to be close to 80. He's got to be in his late 70s. Mm. And um, things like that. We uh, Police officers came. But one, one police officer who came in his uniform was going home, got on his knees and accepted Christ. Mm. I wasn't there for that one. But I used to wax his car. He had, he had antique cars that he collected. And he used to hire me to clean his cars and wax them. Mm. And uh, then, then we had, one time the FBI agents came to my minister's house because what happened is during the, the Vietnam era, a lot of the guys like even me, we had long hair, mm -hmm. they were taking LSD and smoking a ton of weed and taking all kinds of, they were cutting their hair, they were straightening out their lives. Or somebody started calling them and said that my minister was drugging them and brainwashing them because he was <laughs> teaching them the gospel. Uh -huh. So they called the FBI and the FBI went there wow. and they, when they, my minister let them in the house. They said, what are you doing? We got we got people saying that you're drugging people. Blah, blah. He held up a King James Bible. He said, I'm teaching them the Bible. You know what the FBI did? They smiled at us and keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a good job. Because they've seen how ridiculous it was that these men, these young men that were out on the streets with drugging and boozing, were straightening out their lives and turning to God. And, wow. and, getting jobs and cleaning up their act, was that it was changing their lives and for the better. But some of the parents, you know how they are, because you have what I tell people, people don't understand about religion. You have Catholicism, you have the Protestants that broke off from the Catholic Church, you have the, the big uh, Muslim movement, and all these different religions, and all Buddhism and Hinduism and all that, there's all constant religious conflicts. And it's not religion. Salvation comes through repentance. God commanded man to do because God loves mankind. Mm -hmm. He gives them that option. But everybody debates religiously because of traditions yeah. that were passed on down. Like, for example, the Muslims will say Jesus Christ is a white man's God because they go by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Because Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, 
did those paintings of Jesus had a long blonde hair, blue eyes, a very handsome looking man. Mm -hmm. When he wasn't, he was your color. Mm -hmm. Billy Graham said that Jimmy, uh, uh, Jesus Christ was dog skinned and he had woolly hair. Mm -hmm. And he got a bunch of hate letters from people. <laughs> that was Billy Graham, the late Reverend Billy Graham. He, yeah, he, the, the senior, his son preaches now. Um, and I'm in touch with them. I call them up, uh, their prayer lines, and uh, um, I, I, more, I call them. I, uh, I'm in touch with a minister from Israel that I support his ministries, and he's uh, buying prop. He's trying to buy a building in Zion, you know. Mm, and, Zion. Uh, Zion, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's it's his name is Michael Mays or Michael Mize. I, I might admit, I might be mispronouncing his name. He's a Jewish minister, mm -hmm. but he preaches the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. You know, mm -hmm. of course, in Israel, if you preach Jesus Christ, the Orthodox Jews will do like they did to Jesus. They'll slap you in the face, spit at you, mm -hmm. want to kill you. Just as as well as a lot of the Islamic uh, Muslims in the Middle East, mm -hmm. someone will cut your head off. Yeah. And then you have the you have the, the liberal ones that are more liberal and don't want to be violent, but they still have their beliefs because of what they were brought up with. Mm -hmm. Not understanding there's tribal people from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Middle East, even in the Arab, I'm part Arabic from my mother's side, mm -hmm. in Spanish. They're, they're like the, the Jordanites, people from Jordan, or there's a tribe of Lot, and there's a tribe of Dan, there's, there's all different tribal people because uh, that mix, you know, women had children with, mm -hmm. And that's why there's all kinds of conflict going on out there. The Palestinians and the Jews cons for thousands of years been fighting, you know. But a lot of them don't even understand that they're cousins, distant cousins. Mm -hmm. But God's got a time for them. That's what people don't understand. They say, God doesn't want to kill everybody that's not non-Jewish. He said, I so love the world. Mm -hmm. He's given them the same opportunity. He said he's got a, he's got a plan for the Jews. He said it's the apple of Zion. What you see right now with Israel, and we preach that, you take the late Palestinian leader Arafat, they interviewed him on national TV, said, where do you want the Jews to go if you claim that Jerusalem's yours? And we pushed them in the ocean. I said, wait a minute, they're a human race on the earth. You're saying something like what Hitler said, so how can you say that you're of God mm -hmm. if you're hating a people so badly because they're not part of your religious beliefs, so the Jews are into Judaism, they, 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 they go by the laws of Moses and all that, and the Old Testament laws and the Old Testament prophets, and, but they don't accept the fact that Jesus died on the cross. I'm talking about the Orthodox Jews. Mm -hmm. They'll fight with you about that, but they don't deny that the Messiah is coming. They, they'll go to the Wailing Wall and say, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. Uh, but they deny that he died on the cross. That's the Orthodox ones that are not. And the Christian Jews are the ones that accepted Jesus Christ. I said, no. And just like there's Arabic Christians too. You know, I say mm -hmm. Arabic, you know, there's people in the Middle East that's the same. God said out of every nation, he's got remnants of people. Mm -hmm. So that, see, I talk like that because we have so much conflict right here in America when it comes to race and different nationalities. And, you know, we talk white, black all the time and, and God, God says so love the world. And my late minister's dad was a Bible teacher that passed away before him. He said, if you take a little handful, a little piece of clay dirt, not, not clay, play old clay, and put it under a microscope, on a lens and magnify it, you see every race, every color of the human race. Mm -hmm. You see dark brown, you see black, you see white, you see yellow, you see, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, different, different, the copper color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hispanic race, you know, like Latin American, South American, whatever. It's all the colors of the human race are there, but well, God said he made Adam from the clay. Mm -hmm. So that proves that our genealogy speaking, that we all come from the first two human beings through thousands of, you know, I don't know how many years. I'm not, mm -hmm. not going to quote the exact amount of years because I don't even know myself. Mm -hmm. But I get, when people, my my late minister's brother, Sammy, after he, recently had a stroke, he's in his late 70s. When people talk to him about race, he says, we're the human race. <laughs> That's all he said. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like you. Mm -hmm. But he, he had, 
he was a, 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 a ladies' man. The women love him. Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't care what kind of, you know, you know Sam, he, he went out with white women, dark skinned women, Spanish women. Yeah. He had more girlfriends than you could count. Know, <laughs> then you could count. No problem. But they yeah, loved him because he was that type of man. You know, he just he was bubbling. He was always flirt and flirtatious. Always went. He looked like one of the Texas Rangers. He always wore a cowboy hat. And sometimes he'd wear a crazy baseball Boston. That's what I liked about him. He'd wear a Boston helmet. <laughs> oh, he wore a helmet. <laughs> he put it in, like the batting cage helmet. Uh -huh. Or he put it on backwards. And he was what you call a. Um, he was kind of like a backyard a poor man's mechanic. Mm -hmm. And he would work on our cars, you know, you'd pay him and he'd fix your car and give you a, a better deal. Sometimes he'd even sell you. I used to buy junk cars off him, old cars. Mm -hmm. I, never, I never owned a brand new car. I always bought a car for a thousand or five hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, never, I never owned a new car, never. What are some of the signs that somebody's demon possessed? Demon possessed, which I, I had experience with that too. Demon possessed people, their uh, facial expressions can change. Voicing, like a little boy, actually, it's true. A uh, uh, man voice can come out and a lot of foul language, you know, mm -hmm. like, you, like that. Because uh, one of my experiences with that was my minister, the late David, after he calls me up one morning early, at seven in the morning, I was having a cup of coffee. He said, Bob, I got a mission for you. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go to South Providence. My son, his younger son Samuel, had to, was, I started dating this girl who lived in South Providence. She said, he said, I think you got to go over there with my son. To this girl's house, she's a mother. She got a little son about eight years old that's demon possessed. I said, what? <laughs> this is me, you know? Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, I mean, I'm not. He said, I, I need you to go over there. I'll get ready. I'll have the Bible ready, anointing oil. He said, you go with my son. You and him go together. He knows where she lives. And it was a day like today. It was raining. And I think it was in February. And I said, all right, I'll go. You know, so I, I, go, I go to her house. My minister's son, we're in South Providence. It's a pretty, uh, a, a lot of tenement houses, you know, pretty populated area. Kind of laying near Prairie Avenue and those places in South Providence. Mm -hmm. with a lot of houses, you know, tenement houses and stuff. So my minister, I, said, I told my minister son, I got my Bible in the front seat. I said, you and her, you, you go in and get her, bring the boy out, but you guys get in the back seat because I got to drive. Mm -hmm. If he's demon possessed, you don't know what he's going to do. I said, I got my Bible here, well, nothing to be afraid of, but go get her because I don't know this girl. He goes in the house, I got the front door open. <laughs> I'm sitting in my car, I see this little boy come out of the house, shorts, no shoes on. T-shirt. It's winter time. It's mm -hmm. raining. He's like this. He's walking like this. He's got a mean-looking face. You know, a mean look on his face. Mm -hmm. So I get out of the car and I can't. I can't go over and grab him because in somebody's neighborhood, you know, they say a grown man grabbing a little boy. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to you got to have discretion. So I knew what I I yell. I said, Sammy, and you and her get out of it. Get out of here now. This boy's walking, well, you know, I was a little bit mad at them. I said, what are you doing? He's walking down the sidewalk away. I said, y young boy, young boy. Young, he turns around, he's looking at me. He said, your mom wants you. Your mother wants you. Your mother's calling you. You'll see, he's doing a beeline. He's walking to it, but he won't look at me. He turns his head when he's getting near me. He's going like this, almost in my, but then he, he turns in the, he doesn't go in the door. He goes into the backyard. They come out of the house and she's, where is he? I said, he went in the backyard. Listen, I'm going to go around this way. You and Sam go around that way. I don't know what he's going to do, where he's going. This is your neighborhood. This boy's walking around. Somebody's going to call the cops. I said, I can't chase him down. You guys got to get him. Let's do this now. We got This is serious. Mm -hmm. So I went around the side of the I see the bushes moving and stuff. And I'm saying, what the heck? It was kind of eerie, you know. But I'm not going to say I'm the bravest man in the world, but in the anointing, God will anoint you mm -hmm. when you're saved and you've got Jesus Christ in you. You, you get like brave all of a sudden. Well, you're not fear. You're not fearful at all, so to speak. It's not bragging. It's to God's anointing. Mm -hmm. So I look and the cellar door's open. And I, 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 the mother's already in the backyard. With it. I tell the mother, he's down there. There's no light on. She goes down in the basement. And that's where he was. So he, she comes out with him. Sammy and her now get him, and he's fighting. 
like a man almost, you know, like wrestling with them. So they, they had to literally take him by the feet and their hands to put him in my back seat. And he was going, he just said, you're not my effing mother. And it was like the voice wasn't a kid's voice. And I'm saying, she started crying and said, ma'am, don't, don't cry, don't cry. And I said, the devil, don't cry. We're going to get rid of you in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden the kid would get quiet. No, the demon would get quiet. And, see, and I was already, you know, I knew. I said, you guys just hold him. Don't cry, don't cry. I'm like, we know what this is. We're going to take care of this. Don't cry. Don't let that get to you. He's going to say things. He go, hey, mom. And all of a sudden his voice would come out as a kid. The him would talk, you know. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell someone when someone is demon possessed. That's one way. They can, if you, what bothers me about what's going on in America now, you put on TV and you see the haunting and paranormal activity and you got these scientists running their own instruments and they'll go into a house where I know it's a demon, but they don't want to say a demon. Some of them do say that now. They start, some of them are starting to say there's demon activity. And you know, some of them say paranormal or they'll say it's an energy, an entity, or the person that used to live here, who are you, what's your name? You're talking to a demon, first of all. You don't ask a demon, what's your name? Mm -hmm. And then, like, I seen one one night, and it, 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 I shook my head. The guy's in there with all these instruments, and all he goes, ah! And he had a big, a big, a, like, it's like a one degree scorch mark on his back. Mm -hmm. He said he felt the thing go right through him, mm -hmm. you know? and. And then another one also scratches, he screams, he's got scratches on his leg or some pull it, or on his stomach, you know. And, and they still mess with it because they're in denial of what the Bible says about demons, fallen angels, Satan, a legion of angels fell with them. Demon activity is everywhere in this world. Satan comes to steal, destroy, and to kill. Mm -hmm. and God came to, to give life and give it more abundantly through his son Jesus Christ. So I, I preach that, and people, I don't get people to laugh at me, because I profess Jesus Christ. And I said, well, you can mess around with paranormal. And I'll tell you one thing, it's going to backfire here, because in the Bible, the Apostle Paul was casting out devils. And there was a gr group of men that were actually Pharisees and Sadducees. And they wanted to do the same thing, because they wanted glory. You know, They wanted to say, look, we can do the same thing. And they went up to a demon-possessed man that said, we adjure you in the name of Paul, in the name of Jesus. And, and, and the demon said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? And the demon leaped on them. <laughs> you know, and they, but see what happens with these paranormal people, scratches appearing on their body, literally bleeding and everything. Mm -hmm. And they scream and, and they still want to mess with it because they don't want to believe. And it's like here in America, I say, it's inexcusable because so many people, America is the Bible belt of the world. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we evangelize the world. We have more preachers through all our history. Paul Roberts, Billy Graham, I don't care how many ministers we have on TV that preach on the subject. And a lot of those people heard those people, but they don't want to believe it. They're still trying to analyze it instead of submitting to God and say, God, you said it, I believe it. I'm not going to mess with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and when people have columns on their life to cast out devils and stuff like that, they, they do it because they're called to do it. And some people, if they're not called, they're afraid if they don't mess with it, though. If you're not called to do it, don't mess with it. Don't, mm -hmm. don't go around trying to analyze it. Mm -hmm. And one of the other experiences I had, two or two, three of them, there was one young man, I pull up in front of our church on Camp Street. These two young ladies I know come running out of the house, Bob, 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 you gotta help us, we gotta help us. We got a 16-year-old friend of ours, he's talking about killing himself. He's talking about killing himself. He's suicidal. I said, no. Hold on. Let me, let me go. Let me go talk to my minister for a minute. So I run to the my minister and bring the bell. He comes to the door. I said, "There's a young man talking about that's ready to commit suicide." The two girls came over. He knew who, who the ladies were. They lived across the street. And were young women, you know, and and, and uh, subsidized housing. You know, they were poor people living. And they run into all kinds of people. A lot of people selling drugs and stuff. So. We said, bring him over. And my minister said, tell him, bring him over in five minutes. I'm going to get my Bible out. Let's go down to the basement, put our Bibles, and um, bring him over. Well, they brought him over. And he was a young, good looking kid, you know, probably about, I think it was 16, 17. Looked like a high school kid. Mm -hmm. And he was just really, you looked at his face, his face was distraught. He looked like he was just totally, 
you, you, you know, like really, really sad, messed up, like hopeless. Mm -hmm. I should say hopelessness mm -hmm. all over him. Now, in his case, he wasn't demon possessed, he was demon oppressed. A demon could mess with your head, right? Tell you to kill yourself and stuff. People say they hear voices and stuff. That's a part of it. So he talked to us for a few minutes and said that, you know. And, he, and my minister says, well, what we're going to do, we're going to pray, we're going to get rid of that. And no word of a lie, we had our Bible up. When we, when we started going to certain scriptures on that, he's listening. All of a sudden, we, we heard the ceiling. When well, you did see, he started rattling. Because had, we had a, a lowered ceiling, and we had a, a, some kind of foil that we put up. You know, to keep it keep it warm. You know, mm -hmm. keep, you know for, for uh, insulate better insulation. And it started rattling. Also, we hear a gurgling sound like. <sighs> you ever hear a coffee pot when it runs low and starts mm -hmm. the water's running low and starts making it was making noises like that. And one of our church members seemed like an image, like a shadow go right by him. I was looking at my Bible because I was looking up the scriptures and we we'd go to you know these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. Like a lot of people don't want to believe in that. They think that's, they look at the Bible like it's a history book. They don't want to see that it's now, too. Mm -hmm. What goes on then is going on now. And now, even worse, because there's more deception, more evil. Uh, Satan's a master deceiver. So, uh, long story short, we got rid of the, the, the demon. Mm -hmm. The kids started hollering, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sure he was set free. Mm -hmm. The thing left. But that night, we had a wood stove in the basement of our church. My minister went down there to burn some wood. We had like a fireplace. I used to cut wood because we keep the cellar warm. And he hears a, a voice from God. You didn't get rid of him. You know what the Bible says? Go back from whence you came when Jesus cast out the devil. Go back. You, know, you make him leave, you cast him up, but you got to make him leave. My minister said God told him, he looked and he seen an image where we did that, like a, a dark image with almost like a, I don't know if he said a reddish color eyes or something. And then he went over to he said the anointing, he cast it out. He said, go back from whence you came, uh, 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 you demon, in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And we also used to sing a song called the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It'd go, oh, the blood of Jesus. You sing that, and a lot of preachers, from uh, the turn of the century, that uh, when we had a great revival in America, when they cast out demons, they would have the choir sing that song, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. Oh, and, and then the, most preachers in those days would tell everybody in their congregation, Get your hands on your Bible and you pray in the name of Jesus for this. We're going to get this demon out of here. We got videotapes. You can download uh, videos on the, the late uh, Reverend A.A. A. Allen who ran Miracle Valley in Arizona. He was a great revivalist uh, evangelist that traveled around the country. He set up giant tents, like the circus tents. Mm -hmm. And they, they had live films of him casting out devils, mm -hmm. casting out girls that were demon-possessed, and the men had to hold them, and they were sweating everything, and the demons were so, because a demon, if somebody's demon-possessed, that's another thing, supernatural strength also. Mm -hmm. you know, can't hurt a believer if you're truly saved and you got Jesus and you really can't hurt you, but they can mess with you. They can try to play with your head, say things to you, answer back, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, we, you know, these things people don't want to believe, but we're having more of that going on now. More and more and more. And uh, I know another experience, I had my minister call me up. He said, I got a mission for you, Bob, here we go again, you know, and, and I wasn't one of these guys, hey, I'll do it, because I don't brag on myself, because it's serious. A uh, young man, a gentleman living right over off Newport Avenue in a trailer called named Steve. I brought him to church and he got saved. He bought a mobile home and uh, the lady that sold him the mobile home um, had passed away. I mean, the, the girl that sold the mobile home, her mom had passed away. And he found that out later. So he didn't care. He bought the mobile home. But he would go in the bathroom to take a shower and something start banging on the wall. The lights would go on and off. That's something else a demon can do. Mm -hmm. Supernatural stuff. Furniture moves. And he said he, he, he put a can of Spam down that he was getting ready to cook in the kitchen. You know, the butter Spam. And uh, all of a sudden he'd turn around the can was gone. He would be in the middle of the living room floor. Mm -hmm. Shoes. And so he, 
he calls us up. He calls my minister up and says, uh, I'm having a problem. I think the lady that once lived here is still here and she wants me to leave. She died. So my, my minister said, that's not the lady. That's, uh, that's, that's a demon. And so my minister gave me a little bottle of anointed oil. Now, this is when I got nervous. He said, I, Bob, I want you to go over there. I said, me alone? He said, yeah, you know what to do. You've been in Bible studies long enough to know what to do. I said, what? He said, drive over there and you get that out of his, his mobile home. He said, he just doesn't know. He doesn't know the Bible the way you do. Go. God, you, nothing's going to happen. I'll, you gave me a little noise. I said, go in every room in that house and you put oil anointed and say, in the name of Jesus, go back from whence you came and quote the scripture. These signs will follow. Read the scripture first, he told me, you know, with the guy. Mm -hmm. I sat on the couch just like this. The guy sat next to me. And I read the scripture to him first. He said, you're going to go with me in every room in your house. Of God, and we're going to pray. We're going to make this thing leave. It's a spirit, a bad spirit, a demon. We did, you know. Mm -hmm. So nothing happened, nothing, you know, nothing came flying at me, none of that kind of stuff. So he calls us up the next day, he said, I slept like a baby. And I still see him now, Slater Park. He rides through Slater Park on a bike, he walks with his wife and when they have the dog out. And he said, you know, ever since that day, you'll never forget. He said, you never had a problem again. Mm. But see, that's when you see those guys on TV, paranormal activity and entities, People are paying them all kinds of money to go do these stories and stuff like that. And they're not casting the things out. Or they'll burn sage, you know, and mm -hmm. have a lady go to a psychic and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a, a, media, uh, a medium, you know. And that doesn't get rid of it. So that, temporarily, the devil fools them. The place will be peaceful for a while. And then when they leave, all of a sudden, the next day, it started again, and, and even worse, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's funny when they say that, I don't laugh at it because I see the seriousness in it, that it's nothing to laugh at, it's real, you know. And that's just some of the stuff. And I, what I look at now is, okay, just to give you an example about prayer. Our whole country, as you remember, a couple of Monday nights ago, I was watching the Cincinnati Bengals. I like football playing the Buffalo Bills. I was looking forward to the game. I put the game on TV. Another preacher I know was watching it down in the South, you know. And uh, what's his name? Hamlin? Hamlin had a heart attack. Mm. Uh, you know, he tackled a, a oh, receiver. Yeah. He collapsed. He actually died. He died on the field. His heart stopped. Oh, and wow. it was pow, 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 on, you know, in uh, and six young. minutes. He was young, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they brought him through. So now, of course, they canceled the game, which they should have. I prayed for him. They got on with that young man die. I like football, a great athlete, you know, he's 25 years old, mm. second year in the pros, a very good athlete. I pray, you know, because I don't want to see nobody die, and, but I noticed the media in all of America, all of a sudden everybody's praying about this one football player, which this isn't about race, I know he was dark skinned, but it's about but all the stuff going on in our world, the war in Ukraine, kids got killed yesterday in elementary school, the floods out in California, tornadoes, black, black people and white people alike. Dying every day. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that drug called? Fentanyl. 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 Yeah. Kill. I just seen on the news this morning. Fifteen thousand people died this year in America. Mm -hmm. More than the, some of the wars mm -hmm. that we have in a year's time. Fifteen thousand. And they said there's enough of that in America to kill every American. Mm. That's how much of that. And drug lords in Mexico are shipping it in here. And guess who else is back in it? China, mm. communist regime. It doesn't mean all the people in China are evil and all the people in Mexico, but those organizations, the uh, drug lords and the, the communist regime, they hate America. So what, why would they be doing that? Because they want people to die, especially young people, because mm. it makes up your military. Our military is made up of youth, teenagers, 18-year-olds. Uh, when they wanted to send me to Vietnam, I was 18 years old. Mm. That makes up your Navy, Army, Marines, Air Force. Of course, there's all those guys in there, but you, most people on list when they're in their late teens, you know, 18, yeah. 19, and 20. But they're, they're, that's a, an onslaught on America. And I don't hear enough people preaching about it, but I will. I will. I don't care if somebody wants to shoot me. I, I don't care. Yeah. I, jokingly, sometimes I call myself the white Martin Luther King because <laughs> I want to speak the truth. I don't care if people get offended or mad at me. I said, I don't care if you get mad at me. I'm just telling the truth. Yeah, See, you know, how many times I do that at gas station? <laughs> Did I ever have a conflict? You know, uh, no, I never seen anybody attack me, you know, a, a physical conflict, you know. There might have been people that came in here and said something about me verbally, he's an a-hole or something. 
But I don't care about that. You can call me any kind of name. Those names go that way. Yeah. You know, it's like somebody throwing a bird at you. I don't get road rage about that. Years ago, I'd get mad, you know, as a young man. Yeah. Now I say no, because, you know, people are carrying guns, you know. People get killed. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think about hard alcohol? You know how they call it spirits? I think the same way as that as I do marijuana. I think that, it, you know, everybody, recreational marijuana, you know, I'll tell you something. I'm against both. I said, now you watch a football game and they're showing you alcohol. Mm -hmm. They show you Jack Daniels. They show you beer. Oh, the football players ain't getting drunk while they're playing football. They're straight. You know, mm -hmm. some of them might smoke a little weed or something. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, it, it's, you know, I'm dealing with a person now that went to ad care and Kingston had been battling with uh, drinking nips and vodka for years. She, mm -hmm. She's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And she went in there, I had to go there. And uh, I have the Bible with her verses I gave her and she prayed, but she had to get help. Because she buy those little nips and those are shots. Vodka, 100 proofers, you know. But you, yeah, you drink yeah. 10 of those, you're drinking 10 shots. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely eating your liver up, killing brain cells. The marijuana industry with these politicians, recreational, I got friends that smoke that I know, that I don't, mm -hmm. I did years ago during the Vietnam era. I look at the political part of it, I just picked up a New York Post yesterday, that people should get it, said that in Manhattan the city is reeking with the smell of weed because of recreational marijuana and people are mad now, people are getting, they don't like it, there's some people that don't want to smell that all day, mm -hmm. but because they're politicians and money, they, they used to put guys in jail for selling it, Guys on the streets will tell you, here in Rhode Island we have a governor and, uh, and the ex-governor that want to legalize it, but they don't tell you that they're involved with some of the shops. And one of them's family member own, has licenses to run the shops. Mm -hmm. So they said it's going to bring in millions of dollars of revenue for the state, but put millions in their own pocket. So I said, well, well my wallet's the same. I'm paying high prices for food and everything else. Well, how's it helping out? What's that helping? Are you painting the streets over? Are you making better lighting on the roads? At night, people can't even see some of the streets when they're driving. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're driving in darkness. You drive on the highway, the lane, the lane lines are so faded, you can't see them in a lot of the areas, you know. And so, where's all this money going? And then you got McKee and all these guys, you know, make, making an announcement of what he's going to do now that he's got reelected. Or no, it's. To me, it's ridiculous because what I say about that is the same thing like alcohol. You and I could sit here and drink wine, okay? I drank wine many a times. As a matter of fact, one time I got arrested on a DUI back when my minister died. I was dancing with the women. I was really down and out. I did what I wasn't supposed to do. I was out partying, dancing with girls. Mm -hmm. And I got pulled over going 85 miles an hour. I wasn't driving erratic, but it was 1 in the morning, nobody on the highway. Mm -hmm. I opened it up. Two steadies pulled me over. They made me walk the steps both ways. I did it. They, you know, I didn't fall over. They put the light in my eyes and said, your eyes are a little glossy. They knew they could smell it. Said, been, I said, sir, I can't lie to you. I, was, I, had, a, I had a little wine, but I was there for three hours dancing. And they said, how many beautiful women? They started joking me about the women. I said, there's pretty women there. You guys are young stadies. You, if you went there, you'd be able to dance with a lot of ladies. So they arrested me anyway and towed my car. Wow. Well, guess what? It cost me a fortune. You think I'm going to go around telling teenagers it's all right to have a glass of wine or drink beer because I did? Mm -hmm. No, because I could make them an alcoholic. Because if you became an alcoholic because of me, told you in the Bible, you can make somebody stumble and fall. Watch out what you're saying. That's in the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. Okay, marijuana. I'm going to get on that subject. I have a, a, a lot of experiences that I know people that died fighting over it back in the 70s and 80s and all the way up 2001 and whatever, fighting over it because they would get high and they would get they would get you know, aggravated. What are you looking at? Uh? But they would all say, oh, I'm relaxed. I like it. It's good. It's, it's still a depressant, mm -hmm. but the mindset of each individual is somewhat different. You, your mind's different than my mind. Mm -hmm. I might be able to, you know, drink two glasses of wine and get lovable and dance. And somebody else will drink two glasses, but they keep on going. They end up drinking two bottles, two quarts, or three quarts. Mm -hmm. And they, they might get violent or get in a fight or get in an accident or act up. Okay. Same thing with weed. I seen a kid turn around one time and say, it sees his gas engine. It was, it, it was reeking all over him. You know, every time guys come to your gas station, you're looking at you, what's your problem? 
But see, the, the, the hive was unaffected the way he thought. He was thinking wrong. But if I were to, if I were to confront him with that and say, you're smoking that stuff, he would probably want to kill me or punch me in the face or something. And I see people, people my age especially, I call them the old hippies. That's your politicians that want to legalize it. Mm -hmm. It's about money. I call it the Woodstock generation. It's not the people that were at Woodstock, so to speak, them too, because some of them are in power wearing suits and ties and they're politicians, like all those people in Washington now fighting. Republicans and Democrats, they're all like my age and older, most of them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in their 50s and 40s, but most of them, you know, the, the, the Biden crowd and the Donald Trump crowd, know-it-alls, you know, and, and they, they can't reason about nothing, they can't agree on nothing, they're indecisive, they're, they're so divided, it's even being mentioned on the news all the time, we're divided. They say it often, well, the Bible said, a kingdom divided, divided shall not stand. Also, divided shall not stand. Mm -hmm. I mean, a husband and wife fight all the time to get divorced. That's what that means. So, here we are in our own country, and you see this nonsense going on, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus hit, and they're still fighting about money in the economy. You think they would start saying, hey, there's a war going on right now. The North Korean leader is shooting test missiles up in the air and say he can hit America now with one if he wanted to, you know, a, mm -hmm. a ballistic uh, a, a nuclear missile. Uh, back in my time, going back to Louisiana, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everybody thought the world was going to end. Every TV show, every radio station, John F. Kennedy was president. Mm -hmm. They said, if you know how to pray, pray. Just like they did for that football player two weeks ago. Everybody said, pray. I did. I prayed for him. Don't let that man die, Lord. But I prayed for Ukraine. The, the war, I pray for what's going on in California. I pray for Louisiana and Kentucky when they got hit by the tornadoes. And if something happened in New York, I pray for, I have a friend of mine that calls me from the Bronx. She's a young lady who's got two kids and a grandchild. She's scared because people threaten her. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shootings going on and she's a Christian. She's about pray for me. I send her scriptures. I said, God's gonna protect you, don't worry about that. Well, where's all that violence coming from? But do you know they're all smoking and all taking dope and pills? That's all I wanted to say. And they try to say it, it doesn't affect you. Yes, it does. Absolutely. I was going to say, do you think the body is more susceptible to spirits and demons when you when you're drinking? Yeah, I think I think it opens it it, it, it opens up a door to be a demon oppressed, and it actually even demon possessed. If, mm -hmm. if you go too deep into certain things, like you know, back in my time, one of the deadliest drugs around was LSD. Of course, heroin, heroin was killing a lot of people overdosing, mm. and LSD, would, some people never came back to earth when they took it, you know, so to speak. They mm -hmm. went on a bad trip and they ended up being institutionalized, you know. And, uh, Tripping for life. There was a lot of rock groups in time, like the Doors, you know, with Jim Morrison, who died on the bathtub, he would eat whole grams of hash. Wow. You know, oh, and, and drank on top of it. And, his wife found him dead in a bathtub, you know, but... Jimi Hendrix too, right? Jimi Hendrix was taking heroin and taking LSD, and you had Janis Joplin, she was she was an alcoholic. Janis Joplin would drink a, a pint of a Southern Comfort. Mm -hmm. Take another little piece of my heart. No, she was a great blues singer. She was very... She loved Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. when, uh, I, that's when I was in high school. Jimi Hendrix died in 71. Janis Joplin died, I think, a week later. Wow. She, had, she had a needle mark on her and she was never noted to shoot up. She took an overdose, you know, she shot heroin or something. And oh. Jim Morrison died in 71. Nice my brother Mike died in 71 in a car accident. And that was alcohol related. He, he was in the back seat of a car and his guys were all drinking and going over 100 miles an hour and he got killed, you know. Dave, um, you know, I could go on and on. I had a powerful experience in Louisiana where my calling of God started. See, people look at paperwork, or they look at the Vatican, the Pope being elected by the Cardinals, and, or somebody becoming a, a, a Buddhist priest, and uh, they don't see what the Bible says about God calling people, or ordaining men and women that he called to preach his word and to do his will. You know, like when you read the Bible, all the different disciples, all the different prophets, from, mm -hmm. from Genesis to Revelation, everything back, everything's back. All the landmarks in the Middle East, all of, by the Jordan River, all of, even the tomb where Jesus was, it's all, the evidence is here, and things that are happening now have been prophesied, are happening, like Russia, 
Gog and Magog. Eventually they're going to go after Israel. That's in the Bible. With Iran. Now, Iran right now in Russia. Mm -hmm. Iran's always fighting about Israel, mad about, you know, they even said they would want to get rid of the Jews, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you see all that happening, people don't realize that God has the same kind of people on earth today preaching the gospel as, as the men of God and women of God thousands of years ago preaching. And, you know, even like the Apostle Paul, he was getting beaten and whipped and spit at and taken before judges and kings and higher magistrates. And, always in conflict for preaching the blood of Jesus Christ, for preaching salvation. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a high Pharisee. He was a very orthodox uh, Jewish Pharisee. And he had papers to, 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 to decrees to kill Jews, go, or, or kill all Christians rather, mm -hmm. go arrest everybody that believed in Jesus Christ who had them stoned to death or put in prison. And that's when he, when he had his calling, when God called him to evangelize the Gentile world. And just so many powerful things. And my calling started in Louisiana, but it was powerful. The same Baptist preacher that gave me my Bible college lessons used to come to my mom's house when he was hanging with my brother as a teenager in high school. And now he's been a minister for 35, 40 years mm. in the Slido Baptist uh, Seminary College he runs. He's a Baptist minister, uh, uh -huh. pastor. And his name's Paul Dabdu, and he comes from the Middle East. His ancestry comes from Bethlehem. He was Arabic Bethlehem, he was, but not, not Jewish, but he, he, sometimes he calls himself an Arab. <laughs> and, and, and he jokingly says that, but he's a very powerful preacher. And he doesn't like reading from new Bibles and so that he preaches the old King James Bible, the original. And he's a very powerful preacher, very good preacher. But my calling happened down there, it was, a, Powerful thing that happened to me with a storm that I got caught in, and I was a kid, and you know I was yelling at God about something, and something powerful happened to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't want to—you don't want to hear that story now. But I would, I would hear a harmonic tune as 69-year-old Bob LaFerrier jazzes things up a bit with his saxophone. I play here at the park. Every now and then by the water here because of the acoustics, you know. Three to four.